I want you to open your Bibles to a very familiar text, and that is 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to read the first four verses there. By the way, someone complimented my necktie. This is not an orange necktie. It's November, so it's uh, pumpkin spice, right? <laughs> and uh, I'll put it away and wear it again next year. 1 Corinthians 15, and let's read the first four verses there. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest, uh, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures." Um, 1 Corinthians 15 is the longest chapter in that particular book, and it deals with the subject of the resurrection in two respects, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the future resurrection of Christians. Um, what sets Bible Christianity apart from every other religious faith, and we use that term loosely, is we believe the founder of our religion didn't stay dead. He came back to life. And I'm certain that must have frustrated the, the scribes and the priests to no end. I mean, that they were more upset than liberals uh, seeing Donald Trump get elected as president. I mean, they were fit to be tied. And it's been said, you can't keep a good man down, and they, they couldn't keep the Lord Jesus Christ down either. And just when they thought they had gotten rid of some preacher they didn't like to hear... He came back to life after three days. And not only that, he appeared to his disciples in glorified supernatural form. They couldn't kill him again if they even tried. But um, what sets Bible Christianity apart is, uh, from everyone else is, not only do we believe our Savior came back to life, but we don't plan to stay dead either. And in fact, we profess to have eternal life already. I'm not waiting to be saved in the future. I'm not waiting to face the Antichrist and resist taking the mark of the beast uh, in order to prove that I'm worthy of salvation. I'm not waiting to uh, avoid the mark and be, be beheaded as a martyr. I'm saved right now. God. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 6 that God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are seated in heavenly places with him right now. That's a present uh, reality. And you're simply waiting for these, this body of yours to be changed, to be transformed. And then your, your complete regeneration will be, uh, will be fulfilled, be completed. Uh, you say, well, how do I get into Christ? That's the key. You have to be in Jesus Christ. How do you get into Jesus Christ? Very simple. Ask Christ to come live in you. Ask Christ to come live in you, and by that transaction, you are then in Jesus Christ. John 14 and verse 20, the Lord Jesus said, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. So it's a great spiritual transaction that takes place. You go from sinner to saint that fast. You're not waiting for a college of cardinals and the Pope to evaluate your life and see if you're You've performed at least two miracles, you know, to satisfy their requirements. Don't get me started on that. We could go down a rabbit trail and talk about that nonsense for a long time, but we won't do that. Let's stay back on the main highway here. And um, today I want to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, this won't be terribly lengthy, but the word gospel actually means good news. And I call this sermon the gospel good news and bad news. Good news and bad news. Um, most of us have heard jokes that um, include the formula, I have good news and bad news for you. I'll give you a few of them. It's like you're, you're waiting with bated breath for Pastor Shribe's jokes. <laughs> 
Uh, there was a taskmaster in an old Greek slave ship, and you've seen him depicted in the movies where they're all sitting on benches, chained to the benches and rowing to propel the ship. And the uh, master says to the servants, I've got good news and bad news for you, men. First, the, uh, the good news, you're each going to get a shot of rum at the end of the day. All right, they cheered. The bad news, however, is the captain wants to do some water skiing later, so they're going to have to really you know, row. There was a climatologist. They had a press conference, and they said, we have good news and bad news regarding global warming. The, the bad news is uh, within 150 years, the ozone around the Earth is going to be depleted. Cosmic radiation and so forth are going to come through, and we expect the surface temperature of the Earth to be uh, close to 300 degrees, thus destroying all life. The good news, however, is it'll be a dry heat. <laughs> but so, yeah. bump, nobody likes humidity. There's an attorney who told his client, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is the, the uh, lab results tested your blood, and they found your blood all over the crime scene. It's going to be very hard to get out of that. The good news, however, is your cholesterol levels are good. <laughs> The doctor told his patient, I have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is you probably have uh, only three months to live. The good news, however, is I did save some money on my car insurance by switching to GEICO. Uh, um, in verses 1 through 4, particularly verses 3 and 4, Paul defines the gospel as being that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Acts 20 verse 24, there he says that he was sent to testify the gospel of the grace of God. This is the gospel he's proclaiming in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. It's the good news that a sinner by an act of faith alone can be saved from the guilt and the consequence and the penalties of his own sin. Boy, I'm glad of that. You know, the, excuse me, the easiest time in the history of the world to get saved is right now. Yeah. Salvation has never been simpler than it is right now in this day and age. And uh, he can be saved from a destiny in hell by receiving the person of Jesus Christ. When you get saved, you're not subscribing to a set of beliefs. You're not agreeing to a set of a principles or a creed that's been written out by some church denomination, you are receiving a person. The actual person of Jesus Christ comes into you by faith, by the person of the Holy Spirit, and lives there throughout eternity. That's called the quickening of your, your spirit. Your dead spirit is regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit, merging with it. Do I fully understand that? Absolutely not. But is it simple enough that I can grab a hold of it and believe it? Yeah, sure it is. But um, it's the good news that God has done something for the sinner that the sinner couldn't do for himself. He measured out the punishment for your sins um, and that you deserve. And then as a man, in the God in the flesh, he received that punishment to himself in the person of Christ. And uh, died on your behalf, died in your place. Then he rose back to, get, uh, back to life again, victorious over death, victorious over decay and, and uh, uh, corruption of the flesh. And uh, now has ascended into heaven uh, in glorious form, waiting to receive you when you die one day. That's good news. That's the gospel. Write this down as uh, simply point number one, and, th and this won't be a very lengthy sermon, I don't believe, today. Point number one, the gospel has been given. The gospel has been given. That is good news. Good news that you can be saved, you can be uh, regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit, you can have your name written in uh, heaven, never to be erased, you can have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost inside your body, you can have immediate access to the third heaven uh, through prayer, 24 hours a day. You're going to be changed to be... His, uh, I've repeated this several times the last month or so. But a guy that's 
that's born again, he gets saved, or a woman, man or woman, who gets saved, and yet they stumble through their life as a Christian. They never really do anything for Jesus Christ. Many times they fall into sin and they're, they're sort of an embarrassment to other Christians who say, man, I wish that guy could get his spiritual life together. And uh, maybe they go through life and they don't do anything remarkable to speak of for the sake of Jesus Christ. That person is still going to be glorified in supernatural, incorruptible form like Jesus Christ one day. Wrap your mind around that if you can. I can't. But I can believe it because it's written in the book. It's written in God's book. But Paul also calls what he was preaching, and I'll give you some scripture references here, the gospel of God, Romans 1, verse 1. He calls it the gospel of his son, Romans 1, verse 9. The gospel of Christ, Romans 1 16 the gospel of your salvation Ephesians 1 13 the gospel of peace Ephesians 6 15 it reconciles the sinner with God once again the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ 2 Thessalonians 1 8 he calls it our gospel 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14 that is I and other Christians mutually believe it. And he calls it my gospel. Romans 2, verse 16. That's the one God had called him to preach. All of those are uh, terms for the same gospel which we're considering today. The gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the sake and the salvation of the sinner is good news. I'm glad that I trusted it. On November 5th, 1967, uh, just a little over 51 years ago, 51 years ago last week, I was saved. I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I was born again. And I'm only 46 years old. That's an amazing miracle. But, uh, but <laughs> 51 years ago, God saved me. And I can tell you where he saved me, right here. <clears throat> my dad was preaching from this place. I was sitting in the front row, and he gave the invitation. I walked a few steps and was crying my eyes out, needing Jesus Christ, and God saved me. And uh, as a six-year-old boy, all I remember praying and crying out loud was, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. That's all I could think of. I was crying so hard, I don't even think my dad could have, you know, led me in a little prayer if he wanted to. I was just crying, asking God to save me. And later on, I think he took me aside and wanted to make sure I understood what it was I was doing and trusting. And frankly, I don't remember that conversation because I remember getting saved right then and there. And I've never doubted it. That's the marvelous thing. Yeah. What, what's just as great a blessing to be saved is to not doubt it, yeah. to know you're saved, have absolute confidence and certainty and certitude of it uh, all the time. I've been a sorry Christian many times, but I've never been sorry that I was one. And I'm not sorry now. How God can love me in spite of myself, in spite of my faults, in spite of my sins, in spite of the times I've disappointed him is another marvelous miracle. But I'm so glad he does. But uh, it's the gospel that uh, about which Paul says, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed, Galatians 1, verse 9. That leads me to my second point. And this, and this is the bad news. There's more than one gospel. There's more than one gospel. Brother Todd and I were talking this morning about churches who don't believe in the idea of dispensations or rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. God tells you what you're supposed to do. Study. You know something? The King James Bible is the only Bible in the world that uses the word study. All of the others say, be diligent, do your best. That's very loose and ambiguous. But God says, study. And then he tells us why we're supposed to study. To not be ashamed before him and for God's approval. And then he tells us how we're supposed to study. By rightly dividing the word of truth. Compare scripture with scripture and let the scriptures interpret themselves. Yeah. 
My job's not to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change me. Why people can't figure that out? Such a simple proposition, such a simple thing that God presents to the Christian. And yet, so many people who have been saved somewhere along the way, they just stumble through and meander through life as Christians, not knowing which Bible to trust, which Bible is the Word of God. They don't even believe there is one Bible that's the Word of God because their ministers have been pounding into them, we need to update the scriptures. You don't need to update English every four or five years. The English language doesn't go out of date all the time. As a matter of fact, the King James Bible is way ahead of modern Bibles in a lot of places. Paul talks about um, those things which were gained to me, I counted but loss and do count them, but dung that I may win Christ. The new Bibles don't update that. Now, I'm not saying they should, but uh, they don't update that one. Romans 12, verse 3, For I say unto every one of you, by the grace of God, unto every one of you, uh, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You know what the opposite of being sober is these days? Being high. How's that for being up to date? It's way up to date. But point number two, there's more than one gospel. I want you to go over to the book of Matthew, chapter 4. Matthew, chapter 4. And notice there, verses 23 and 24. Matthew 4, verses 23 and 24. It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. It says in that text that he was preaching the gospel. But it wasn't the gospel of, that Paul preached. It was the good news... That's what the gospel means. It was the good news that the king of the Jews is now here. He's offering the kingdom to the nation of Israel if they would turn and receive him as their savior and as their Messiah. If they would repent of their sins and receive him. And it was preached exclusively to the nation of Israel by John the Baptist and then later by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was confirmed it was, uh, it was proven to be true, proven to be authentic from God by the miracles and the healings that the Lord Jesus was doing that accompanied it, accompanied it. But it had nothing to do with believing on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because those things hadn't happened yet. Uh, there's more than one gospel. There's a popular Mormon book called The Gospel Principles. The Gospel Principles, and it so I've got a couple of copies back in my office, if any of you really want to read one, which I doubt you do, but uh, they give advice in just about every aspect of, of life, your family duties as a husband or as a wife, as children, your obligations as a student, as an employee, as an employer, uh, your community responsibilities, your habits of hard work, honesty, thriftiness, loyalty, your diet, your health your exercise, the way you spend your money and your free time, your devotion to the church, to what they call their sacrament meeting, which is their communion, uh, to the missionary work of their, of their church, to tithing, to neatness, cleanliness, your appearance, and many other things. And uh, if you follow these, you're said to be obeying the gospel principles or the principles of the gospel. But if we accept Paul's definition in our text, it means that the good news is not be kind to your neighbor. The good news is not be a good church member and have a clean haircut. The good news does not require church membership. The gospel does not require water baptism. The gospel does not require uh, that you love your neighbor first and earn your way into heaven by that means. I have a friend, he's a Mormon, I, I see him on occasion during my job, and uh, he 
I was asking him about his religion, and I gave him a, one or two questions that he couldn't answer. And uh, so he danced around a little bit in our conversation, and he said, well, we, one thing we do know, oh, by the way, let me just back up. For the benefit of any, all of you and the benefit of anyone watching uh, online, when you talk to a Mormon, say, listen, I'm not a Mormon, but let me see if I understand your basic uh, beliefs. Uh, the basic belief of Mormonism is that Jesus brought the fullness of the gospel when he first came. He taught it to his apostles, and they went out to preach it. But within 100, 200 years, it had gotten corrupted. It's called the Great Apostasy. And then people sort of muddled their way through the several centuries after uh, with parts of the gospel, parts of Christianity, but not the full, uh, the true gospel in its fullness. And then the Latter-day Prophet Joseph Smith restored it into its fullness as it once had been. Is that basically what Mormonism teaches? And of course, they're going to say yes, because that is what they teach. So then you say, well, let me ask you a question then. Where was the first Mormon temple in the New Testament? Obviously, it couldn't be in the Jews' temple. That's where the Levites were slaughtering animals every day. So where was the first Mormon temple where marriages were sealed, where or baptisms were performed for the dead who died before Christ came along, where your families were sealed, and so forth. Temple, temple endowments, as they call them. Where was the first Mormon temple in the New Testament? And of course, I asked this to my friend, and he kind of had a bewildered look on his face, and I said, obviously, um, the reason I'm asking is, you can't restore something if it never existed to start with. And there's nothing in the Jewish history or Jewish antiquity that would suggest that such sacrifices, such offerings or baptisms for the dead took place in the Jews' temple. And I'm not, I'm not kidding you. You'll throw a roadblock in their path that they can't drive over. And, he, and so he, my friend, said, well, one thing we do know is um, that they were baptizing on behalf of the dead in the first century. And I said, you know what you've done? You've just taken 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If, they, if the dead rise not, why are they then baptized for them? And of course, he, he couldn't cite the reference because they don't memorize scripture like you and I do. So I, re I cited the reference to his verse, and I said, you know, a, a text without its context is a pretext. It's used to prove something that might not be true. I said, uh, the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, is about the resurrection of Christ and the future resurrection of the saints, of believers. And uh, you, you had just told me earlier that the gospel for Mormons... Uh, is believing and being baptized in water by an ordained uh, elder and uh, a couple of other things. And yet Paul's, Paul defined his gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, the first four verses, as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 1, verse 17, the same book, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Which means those two verses coupled together uh, prove that water baptism is not part of the gospel. There are two separate things. Uh, one is the fruit, the byproduct, the obedience of a new Christian after he has been saved. But water baptism doesn't save a dead dog. And uh, all I have to do is believe on him. Believe on him. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to earn it. I have to believe it. Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. The Jews gave answer to Moses and they said, It shall be our righteousness if we, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. And that's how their righteousness was measured and established. And yet in the New Testament, Titus 3, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that washes and regenerates and renews the sinner when he trusts in Jesus Christ. So the gospel is not the same for everybody in every age and every place. Anybody that thinks so or approaches the Bible that way is not a serious student of the Bible.
ignore whatever they tell you. They obviously they're they're a, a child playing with a, a butcher knife when they, what they really need is one of those plastic things you get at Del Taco, you know, right? That's about all they can handle. Don't give them a, a, a knife to slaughter animals with that's razor sharp. They'll cut themselves all over the place with it. You give them something made by Hasbro or, you know, Tinker Toys or something like that and let them play with that. But the good news uh, given to Noah was that if he would build an ark, that's the, the big boat, not that thing that Ken Ham and uh, the creation people built, the Bible doesn't describe the ark like that. There is no whole curved shape to the bottom of the ark described in the book of Genesis. It was a long rectangular box like a coffin. And the rest of the world was dying around it. All it was made to do was to be buoyant and float. It wasn't made to go anywhere. Kent Hovind had that much right. He said it wasn't, they weren't intended to go anywhere. They were simply intended to keep them alive. So don't go back to the amusement park called, you know, the, the Ark Adventure Land. That's, got like, that's just got TBN type stuff written all over it. By the way, I didn't know the Ark had a gift shop. And, and, and the one that back there does. And the corridors are wide enough where all the people can walk down and look into the stalls and see the, the, you know, the fake animals and the robotic uh, animals and so forth. It amazes me. Nah, I'm right here. Let's, just, let's just move on. But um, the, the gospel that the Jews believed, it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, that won't help you today. And uh, the gospel of Noah building the ark to save his family from a worldwide flood of God's wrath, that won't help you at all. Um, hoping to keep all the commandments given to Moses in the Old Testament won't do anything to affect your salvation today at all. And believing that Israel's king is here now, offering the kingdom to them, uh, can't save your souls now either. So the good news is that the gospel has been given. The bad news is there's more than one. There's more than one gospel, which leads me to the third point. Be sure you have the right one. Be sure you have the right one. Paul rebuked the church in Galatia, saying, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, Galatians 1, verse 6. And then he says in verse 8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So it's safe to say that if one preaching a different gospel is accursed, um, likewise, those who believe that different gospel are going to be accursed as well. But uh, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, we read this. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God. And give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, period. So there's an angel flying through heaven, preaching another gospel that Paul didn't preach. But the angel is not accursed. His gospel had nothing to do with worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ or his death, burial, and resurrection. It had to do with worshiping God as the ultimate creator of the universe. Evolution apparently isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. And atheism isn't going anywhere anytime soon. But that gospel won't help you now. The Apostle Paul explains the gospel right now as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. He makes it clear that um, it's not a message offered only to the Jews either, as as the one Christ preached was. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1, verse 16. 
And he tells us that it's not a measure of how much good you've done, but how obedient you are in doing good, or how obedient you are in believing the gospel. That's a better, a better way to phrase it. Not how much good you've done, but how much good he's done, and are you trusting in that? I can't depend upon my own good deeds, my own merit, my own good intentions, my winning smile, my good looks, right? I can't depend on that at all. And nor can any of you. I'm looking at you, I can tell. <laughs> I'm depending on how good Jesus Christ was, and all of my hope and my trust have to be in Him. So I believe that not only did he rise from the dead, but by me trusting in him, he promises to raise me from the dead. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And a great verse, which is verse 10, right after that says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's how your Christian is supposed to live. But that doesn't save him. That's what he's supposed to do after he's saved. Uh, most unbelievers think that it's up to them to somehow live right and be a cl have a clean life and somehow merit and earn God's attention, earn God's salvation. But it doesn't work that way. They think God is going to weigh their good deeds against their bad deeds and see which way the scales tip, and that'll determine where they spend eternity. That's the wrong gospel. If you believe it, you're going to be cursed. And Paul tells us, for he, that's God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, that we who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So are you in Jesus Christ? Let me begin to bring this to a close. If you're in Jesus Christ, that means he's in you. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. I'm glad that I have him. I'm glad that I know him. And uh, let me conclude with, with one more blessing. I mentioned my date of salvation, November 5th, 1967. My father's spiritual birthday is coming up this week on the 15th. And if I calculated it right, it's 66 years since my dad trusted Christ to save him. And he's here today, and if it weren't for him getting saved, I wouldn't have gotten saved. And if I weren't, hadn't gotten saved, uh, he wouldn't be here listening to me. <laughs> but um, since that time, I can say I've been in Christ because I believed the right gospel. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with him and whether or not I'm trusting in him alone. 